This time, we're going to have a nice, easy start. We're going to let you see a children's story told by Maury. Actually, you're going to see the whole of the story in this tape. But we'll start off with the first installment. And we'll let you see the rest at the end of the tape. Fourteen Rats and a Rat Catcher by Tamazin Cole. Long, long ago, there was an old woman who lived in a house. A beautiful house, a cottage. And all around the cottage were lots of trees. And the woman would stand outside, watching the world go by and enjoying the fresh air. But underneath the floorboards of the house, there were a lot of rats scurrying around. Yes, the rats that were milling around, they were lovely, 14 of them. And there was one large, important looking rat with light brown fur. And they would talk around the fire and enjoy themselves and food was nailed to the rafters. Whereas up above, there was a nasty old woman who was always moaning and shouting at them. They were sick of her. So one day, the old woman got up and she decided, I'll go to town to do some shopping. So she walked on into town and she saw a pet shop. What was in the pet shop? Animals, dogs and cats and mice and everything, all sorts of things. And the woman thought and thought, how, what kind of animal will I have? I've got something in mind about what to buy. So she went in and she saw a parrot swinging drunkenly from its perch and cages with birds flapping around and she rejected them all. I don't want this or this or that. But meanwhile, what was happening? Back at the house, the rat family were having a great time because the old woman had gone away shopping. They were free and they scurried all over the house because there was nobody in there. They stole the cheese and they ate things and they read books and they swung from the banisters and they nibbled at furniture. Nothing was damaged, but they just enjoyed themselves. And the family said, good riddance. With the old woman not here, it's much better for us. When she is, it's really awkward and we're forced to stay down below. We don't feel comfortable. We'd much rather she was away so we would have the house to ourselves. That evening, the old woman came back. Do you remember I told you she'd gone to the pet shop? What did she come back with? She'd bought a cat. A beautiful orange striped cat. It looked really fierce. And it prowled along. And the woman spoke to it. And she was thinking about the rats that it could get rid of. And the cat padded along, eyes alert. And they walked to the house. And the rats heard them coming. And they scuttled out way down beneath the floorboards. The woman opened the door and she spoke to the cat. I hope you like living in my house. Now remember what you must do. Mm-hmm. And they went into the kitchen. And she poured out some milk into a saucer and gave it to the cat. And the cat meowed and lapped the milk and the woman stroked it and it lapped the milk until the milk was all gone. But the rats peered out from beneath the floorboards. Oh! And they went down and spoke to the other rats and said, Up there, there's a big, fierce cat. I'm afraid of it. I'm frightened to go up there. We'll have to stay down beneath. And the chief rat said, Stay down here? No. I'll show him. We'll have to do something. We'll have to plan something.
The cat tried hard to catch the rats, but it had no luck because the rats were just too fast. They raced all over the house, and the cat tried. But the cat was just too fat. It just couldn't catch them, because they raced all over. The chief rat had said, I'll go this way, you go that way, and somebody else will go up there, and we'll race all over the place. And the cat just won't be able to catch any of us. We'll exhaust him. He just won't be able to catch us. So they scuttled all over the place, and the cat tried. But it didn't catch one, not one. The woman leapt onto the table and she screamed, Kill them! I'm trying, I'm trying, but there are too many of them. And the woman stood there. She was annoyed. She was angry. She said, You're no good. At the end of the week, after a week that the cat had been there, it hadn't caught anything. And the cat looked at the woman and she said, you can't stay here any longer, you'll have to go back. And the cat trembled, come on, with me, back to town. So they walked and the cat slunk along behind, thinking of the milk and all the things that it would miss now that it had to go back. And they walked on in, back to the pet shop. And the cat had to be returned. Well, now you've watched that, you certainly don't need me to tell you that the face is important in sign language. But let's look a little bit more carefully at what work the face is doing. What information is it giving us? Can you remember the two categories of signs that we've talked about in the first tape? We talked about that was the tape on non-manual features. In the first group, there were multi-channel signs where we must have a particular facial expression. And the second group were ordinary signs, normal signs, which could have an extra piece, an extra bit added from the face, which made a little change in the meaning, or some change in the meaning. Now Maureen uses both kinds of signs. At the beginning of the tape, we had a couple of examples of... Both of these signs, we've seen them before. And they show exactly where the rats were. They were really there. And exactly where they were. You'll also have noticed that there were lots of examples of Maureen using puff cheeks. They're used in sign language as what we call an intensifier. In English we might use a word like very. So when Maureen signs there were lots of trees We might translate that, there were many trees, or very many trees. There are other examples like when the rats are having a great time, they're having a party. And she uses a sign that we already know for party, but that she adds the puff cheeks, showing what a marvellous party it was. When she was in the shop and she was looking at the different animals and she told us that there are a whole lot of different animals, again there's the puff cheeks, to emphasize how many animals there were in the shop. When the rats scuttled downstairs they're in fear of the cat, and they see the cat. They rush downstairs. You'll know what type of cat it was. From the very clear description Maureen gives, 
But one of the signs he uses, we can translate as fierce or vicious. That's a sign where we really need to have puff cheeks. You can't just say, it would look very strange. But it's not only puff cheeks that are important. Do you notice the way that Maureen told us that the woman was always angry and she was always nagging? She was nagging the rats. Do you see what she did with her face? Look at it again. Be check it, because it's very clear and it's giving us that extra information. We know the parrot in the pet shop was swinging upside down. But we also know that it was swinging in a crazy way. It was a crazy way and a drunken way. And we know that through the mouth. Just that information, that extra information. When the rats were peering, peering out, looking at the cat, you can see the sign move and the eyes move to show what's actually happening. There's one part of this tape that would like you to concentrate again on very carefully. Watch it again and again. Because if you listen to the translation, you get very clear English translation. But the language you see there on the screen is nothing like English. The section we're talking about is translated as, and the family said, good riddance with the old woman, not here. It's much better for us. When she is here, it's really awkward and we're forced to stay down below. Now, if you actually look at that, you'll see that Maureen, that Maureen uses several signs that need facial expression. So when she says, and she's talking about the woman's not here, she says, When she says, she is here, she's concentrating on that, and she's stressing that. So again, she uses the sign, the existence sign that we've already seen. When we're being told that it's really awkward, when you'll see the rats you'll actually see them withdrawing back in the mouth pattern. And that shows how nasty it was, that they didn't like it. It was awful for them, and they were forced to stay below the ground. So if you look at that piece of tape again, you will see the link between the face and the hands. Because very often, the modification in the face is also linked with the modification in the hands. So the sign itself is changed. It might be repeated. It might go on for a longer period of time, extended. It might be shortened. Now you might think that it's all very well. Perhaps it's just a few people that we're seeing again and again on these tapes that have these strange signs and strange facial expressions. So we thought it would be quite important here to let you see some other people that we have filmed in the past. These people have been filmed by the research team. And we've filmed a number of deaf people throughout Scotland. 
as you'll see, the filming isn't quite the same, the same quality. I'm not saying it was my responsibility. No, it was us as a team. We did it. We did the filming. And it's not bad. It's okay. But I think you can still see clearly how you get these very tiny, slight changes in facial expression. And they change the meanings of signs. I'm saying that you'll be able to see clearly, but probably you'll have to watch them several times again and again, because the signing might seem very quick to you. So I'm going to ask Jerry to talk us through these examples. Let's have a look at the tapes. And the first example from the group is about puff cheeks. You'll see Fiona talking about the Pope's visit to Ireland. She's signing and she's explaining about a lot of people that are there. But she adds something which you may be able to get hold of and see. And that's this that there were a lot of people in Ireland. I don't know. I wonder if deaf people will be there. There are many deaf people in Ireland. They must be there. You'll see John talking about discussing and again, there's puff cheeks. Should he sign this way? But with, with the puff cheeks, it means it's easy to communicate with deaf people. One group to another. Roman Catholics to Protestant, communicating easily. It's the same as the deaf. But hearing people, they're bitter against each other. But for the deaf, it's different. They can communicate easily. They're friendly. Again, John is talking about the expensive CFAX televisions. Nobody's buying them because they're too expensive. If there is a lot of people buying them, if they're spread throughout the country, if they're spread, then the prices will go down of the TV set. Always with something new, there's a new model or something new, they cost a lot. When you sell more, then the prices will go down and down and down. Now you'll see in the next piece of tape, it's about Muriel in school, her school days, a long time ago when she was small, and she found it very difficult to see the teacher. So she became bored. And see if you can see something, see if you can get hold of something. It's the tongue. Now that tongue is in the second group. When I was at school, the teachers would talk. This was when I was at school, before when I was small at school. The teachers would talk and talk, and I didn't know what they said. I would stare at them. I really couldn't be bothered. I lost a lot of interest in my work. Went in one ear, out the other. Fiona, again, is finding it very difficult to concentrate on the teacher. So she turns and talks to her classmates, her friends in the classroom and she talks in this way. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, or just chatter. Yes, I didn't know what to say. We would just chatter together. When Fiona went to see the doctor, she had to go with someone, and they went together. And they went into the doctor's room, and she was waiting and waiting and waiting. Do you notice something there? She's getting annoyed. The two of them, who went together to see the doctor, but the doctor and the other person talk for a long time. So Fiona adds something in the, her signing, the tongue. I'll never forget when I took my baby, Elsa. I took her for a hearing test. We went in and it was tested. And then the doctors talked and talked and talked for say about 15 or 20 minutes. Never said what they were talking about. Now the third group. It's about the stretched lips. If you were in school at that time, she found it very difficult to concentrate at school on the teacher in the speech so you'll see something there she signs and she shows how she's straining and concentrating At school, the teachers would talk. This was at school before when I was small. The teachers would talk. I looked, didn't know what they were saying. I stared. And now we're talking about the two religions, one Roman Catholic and one Protestant. Can you see something with the stretched lips about these two groups? Here's the example. Ian Paisley, he's a real troublemaker. He should allow Roman Catholics and Protestants to mix together, not stay bitter enemies. Another one is Muriel again. In school. She's saying that in school the children have to learn some signing. And when they grow up, they move maybe to another classroom or outside and again they have to use finger spelling. What do you see? You see this. You learn Paget Gorman and now when they go to another classroom they have to change to our way of finger spelling. It was hard work. They would have to learn the new Paget and then they would have to change again to learn to be the same as us. Well, I hope you enjoyed seeing a few new faces and are beginning to get some idea of how these non-manual features work. One of the things that we find when we look at these videotapes closely is that sometimes we get the feeling that one particular person doesn't use facial expression very much. But then, when we look again, we see that it's simply because their way of using it is slightly different. The movements are not as big, but we can recognize them as the same movements. When we've looked at the tapes a few times, again and again, one of the things that we're trying to do is to match the type of non-manual feature and the facial expression with the meaning that it has in the language if we add it to a particular sign. Now actually that's a little bit more difficult than we first thought. Let's take an example like 
we know that usually when you add that to a sign it usually has an unpleasant connotation so if I sign work and I add then that means I didn't really enjoy it I didn't enjoy my work it wasn't nice another meaning it has that it sometimes has is that it was easy so if I say something like I'm signing that means that it's easy simple communication so what we're beginning to see is that we have to take the original meaning of the sign and then add the idea of the unpleasant connotation and so we get and we end up with a slightly different ending I think now we'll have another look at a, a little bit more of Maureen's story I'd just like to make a few points about the kind of body movement that you'll see because one thing you might have noticed in the first part is that often Maureen uses what we call role play when we had the situation of the cat and the old woman we knew who was talking to whom from that non-manual information because the cat is looking up and the woman is looking down talking to the cat so you can see the two different angles so we need to look out for those kinds of clues so we're trying to understand the story and the other thing we can see very clearly is that there is some what we might call natural gesture the way that you yourselves might gesture so when the, the old woman ah sorry I got it wrong when the old man is sitting thinking you can see him meditating and we might do that ourselves I'm sure that you enjoyed the old woman getting up in the morning and you can see Maureen change and become the old woman and taking out her rollers and walking downstairs I'll try and do it for you so you can see that she tries to look her best for the man who's sitting downstairs there are several other signs that you've already seen and modifications of signs that you've already seen but just a couple to give you an idea of the rest of the story when everybody was fast asleep downstairs you can see them with puff cheeks so the puff cheeks are emphasizing that everybody was fast asleep when we hear that the rats are worried and the stomachs are churning so that the mouth again is adding this unpleasantness and when the rat and the rat catcher the rat and the man met in the barn they didn't meet like this they clashed and you can see the surprise and shock in the way the two people meet perhaps you'd like to see the rest of the story for yourselves and see just how non-manual features are used by Maureen so bye for now meanwhile back at the house the rat family were having a marvellous time 
We've got rid of the cat. I knew we'd win. I knew we would. We were right. That evening, after the cat had been returned, the woman came back to the house with a man. Who was the man? He looked nice, but who was he? And the woman explained to him, I've got a problem. And the man said, hmm, never mind, I'll deal with it. And the woman was pleased. But the man, he was the rat catcher. He would catch and kill the rats. And the old woman really had confidence in him. So, that same night, the man and woman sat and chatted, and they became rather fond of each other. They had the same taste and the same ways, and they sat and talked. And the man had no fear of rats, although the woman was frightened of them. He was used to catching them, but the woman was terrified. But they liked talking to each other. Meanwhile, the rats had peered in the window. What were they talking about? I can't hear them. What are we going to do? The man's huge. We can't kill him. We can't get rid of him. He's maybe a very fast runner and he catches. And they spoke about this and the next thing and they thought, it means we're not going to be happy. We'll have to stay down below. Perhaps we won't see each other again. Goodbye. I might be killed, although you might live, but you might be killed. And they were sad. There was no celebrations. They stayed down below. What a shame. The woman had gone to bed, but the man, he was still sitting up. He sat at the table, and he thought and thought. He wasn't setting traps or putting down cheese. He just sat and thought. The rats were all fast asleep. They weren't working, looking around the house. They were fast asleep. They were worried and sad and upset. Underneath the floorboards, there were bunks, like hammocks, in rows, and down below were the rows of beds, and it was the same throughout the house. The man was still sitting up there, not working, sitting and thinking, and the rats were sound asleep. And then the man went out to the shed. He was hunting the rats. They weren't there, so he went into the barn. And he looked around. There's no sign of the rats. But the chief rat had come out and was walking into the barn. And in the barn, they suddenly bumped right into each other, the big rat and the man, <gasps> face to face. What to do? So they stood back. Come here. Oh, no, you'll kill me. And the man said, no, come here. You're the chief rat. Yes, I'm the chief rat. I have a problem. And the chief rat said, so do I. The woman's very annoyed at you invading the house all the time. Well, we're annoyed at her. She's always moaning and shouting at us. Doesn't give us any freedom to enjoy ourselves. I haven't come here to kill you. No? Will you give us cheese? No. Uh, if, if the two of us talk and come to some agreement... Oh, wait first. Let's hear your side of the thing before I agree. And the old woman was still sound asleep, thinking perhaps the rat catcher was downstairs working. Tomorrow there wouldn't be any rats in the house. In the morning, she got up. 
and she yawned, and she took out her curlers and combed her hair and got dressed for the man downstairs. And she walked smartly down the stairs, and the man was sitting there. Good morning. Good morning. He didn't look exhausted or tired. He just sat there. He was quite smart. That means he hasn't been working during the night. He's been asleep. He's made a fool of me. Let's see. Do you want some tea? Oh, yes. So she went into the kitchen, and she made the tea, and she made a sandwich, and she opened the cupboard, and the cheese was still there. Usually it was nibbled, but it was intact. Perhaps he has got rid of the rats. And there were no paw marks. <gasps> but wait a minute. i better have a good check around. And there's no sign of the rats. That's marvellous. The man has destroyed them. But where are the dead rats? There aren't any. She went and spoke quickly to them. Have you got the rats? Well, no. Meanwhile, underneath the floorboards, the rats were very quiet, eating the cheese and everything that the man had given them, sausages and everything. They were having a great feast, ignoring the woman upstairs. But the big rat and the man had talked. I thought they were only talking about the food, but no. The man was attracted to the old woman, both very fond of each other, and they decided to get married. And the rats were really happy. They knew that they would always be fed, because they were now married. And they'd be free. They wouldn't have to hunt for food any longer. They'd be fed, and they'd be as happy as kings. The story's finished. They must have been very happy. <laughs>